Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. It's Pastor Tim, and I am thrilled to bring you today's message, and it is on God's ways are higher. But first, we want to open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name in this house today. And we thank you, Lord, that you are our God and we are your people. We pray now, Father, that Holy Spirit will illuminate the word, for our desire is to worship you in spirit and in truth, to build one another up in our faith and to reach out to the lost with the gospel. And this we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, I'm going to begin in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 9. I'll be reading this passage from the King James Version. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now men shouldn't jump or shouldn't judge Jehovah by their own thoughts and ways. This is what is being relayed here. He thinks and acts in ways that transcend anything man could ever imagine. This is never more true than in the gospel plan of salvation, which is all of God's grace and allows no glory in self-effort. We know the gospel is if you are watching and or you're here and you do not know what I mean by being born again, we believe in the eternally self-existing God, in the persons of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This is outlined in the Word of God, the Bible. We believe that God the Son, the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, left glory, laid down his glory, was born of a virgin, wrapped in flesh, lived a perfect life, never sinned, and shed his precious blood to pay the debt for our sins once and for all, past, present, and future. When you believe that Yeshua, Jesus, is Messiah, and that he shed his precious blood, died was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. You believe Jesus is Messiah, and you believe on the resurrection. You are born again, saved, sealed, and sanctified until the day of redemption, heaven bound, and rapture ready. And in the description of this video, there will be the scriptures that relate to that. If not, you can look up a video I've done, Faith Plus Nothing equals salvation and eternal security. One theologian, William Cowper, expressed it with his usual elegant English in his poem titled Truth. Oh, how unlike the complex works of man, heaven's easy, artless, unencumbered plan. No meretricious graces to beguile, no clustering ornaments to clog the pile from ostentation as from weakness free. It stands like the cerulean arch we see, majestic in its own simplicity, inscribed above the portal from afar, conspicuous as the brightness of a star, legible only by the light they give. Stand the soul-quickening words, believe and live. It's important to remember when you are facing situations in your life that we want to know God's will in every situation, that God will enlighten us, that he would open our eyes to his wisdom, to his knowledge, to his direction for our lives. Now, we can try to do things our way and rely on ourselves, but we know that doesn't work out so well. We're going to be going to 
Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 19. I'm going to read that first from the Passion Bible. Dear friends in Philippi, my name is Paul, and I am joined by Timothy, both of us servants of Yeshua, of Jesus, the Anointed One. We write this letter to all his devoted followers in your city, including your pastors, and to all the servant leaders of the church. May the blessings of divine grace and supernatural peace that flow from God our wonderful Father and our Mashiach, our Messiah, the Lord Jesus, be upon your lives. Now he's praying now for the Philippians. My prayer, prayers for you are full of praise to God as I give him thanks for you with great joy. I'm so grateful for our union and our enduring partnership that began the first time I presented you the gospel. I pray with great faith for you because I'm fully convinced that the one who began his glorious work in you will faithfully continue the process of maturing you and will put his finishing touches to it until the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have to pause and say this. The nanosecond you believe on the Son of God, done deal, heaven bound, and rapture ready, you're saved. Now that you are saved, this is what Paul is telling them. It's no wonder I pray with such confidence since you have a permanent place in my heart. You have remained partners with me in the wonderful grace of God. Even though I'm here in chains, Paul was imprisoned, for standing up for the truth of the gospel. Only God knows how much I dearly love you with the tender affection of Jesus, the Anointed One. I continue to pray for your love to grow and increase beyond measure, bringing you into the rich revelation of spiritual insight in all things. This will enable you to choose the most excellent way of all, becoming pure and without offense until the unveiling of Christ. <clears throat> and you will be filled completely with the fruits of righteousness that are found in Jesus, the Anointed One, bringing great praise and glory to God. Now he continues talking about his imprisonment. I want you to know, dear ones, what has happened to me has not hindered, but helped my ministry of preaching the gospel, causing it to expand and spread to many people. For now, the elite Roman guard and government officials overseeing my imprisonment have plainly recognized that I am here because of my love for the Anointed One. And what I'm going through has actually caused many believers to become even more courageous in the Lord and to be bold and passionate to preach the word of God, all because of my chains. It's true that there are some who preach Christ out of competition and controversy, for they are jealous over the way God has used me. Many others have pure motives. They preach with grace and love filling their hearts because they know I've been destined for the purpose of defending the revelation of God. Those who preach Christ with ambition and competition are insincere. They just want to add to the hardships of my imprisonment. Yet in spite of all of this, I am overjoyed for what does it matter as long as Christ is being preached? If they preach him with mixed motives or with genuine love, the message of Christ is still being preached. And I will continue to rejoice because I know that the lavish supply of the Spirit of Jesus, the Anointed One, and your intercession for me will bring about my deliverance. So I want to break this down, and we're going to go through that passage. So in this passage, Paul is in prison, and we're talking about 
God's ways are higher. When you're going through it, you may not understand. Believe me, I've gone through situations that I don't understand why I'm going through it, but I trust God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is one of the first passages I ever memorized as a child. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And I can declare that in the midst of tragedy. Our God is an awesome God. Praise God. He is worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Well, in this passage, Paul's in prison. The prayer is ended. Paul next rehearse, rehearses his blessings. That is, the benefits that have resulted from his imprisonment. Can you believe that? Paul is actually sharing with them. There's benefits. Can you imagine? And the prisons then. It wasn't like our prisons here in the U.S. And now, Paul would have probably been standing in sewage, chained by guards. It was not what we know prison life to be. And this is not good. But what he went through was deplorable conditions. One theologian, Joet, calls this section the fortune of misfortune. The apostle would have the brethren know that the things which happened to him, that is, his trial and imprisonment, have resulted in the furtherance of the gospel rather than its hindrance, as might have been expected. This is another wonderful illustration of how God overrules the wicked plans of demons and men and brings triumph out of seeming tragedy and beauty from ashes. Man has his wickedness, but God his ways. I'm going to say that again. Man has his wickedness, but God his ways. Oh, our God is an awesome God. First of all, Paul's chains have become evident as being in Christ. This would be contrary to our thinking and our understanding. By this he means that it has become widely known that he was in prison as a result of his testimony for Christ and not as a criminal or evildoer. The real reason for his chains became well known throughout the palace guard and in all other places. Palace guard may mean either uh, the whole praetorian guard, that is the Roman soldiers who guarded the palace where the emperor dwelt, or it can mean the whole praetorian itself. The praetorium was the palace, and here would include all of its occupants. In any event, Paul is saying that his imprisonment has served as a testimony to the representatives of the Roman imperial power where he was. T.W. Drury writes this, the very chain which Rome, Roman discipline riveted on the prisoner's arm secured to his side a hearer who would tell the story of patient suffering for Christ among those who the next day might be in attendance on Nero himself. A second favorable outcome of his imprisonment was that other Christians were thereby encouraged to be more fearless in testifying for the Lord Jesus. Persecution often has the effect of transforming quiet, and bashful believers into courageous witnesses. I'll give you an example. In Iran, if you know anything about that culture, that Islamic Middle Eastern culture, women, listen, in some Islamic nations, women are considered property of the men. They are considered like furniture like a chair would be. And I do not agree with that or believe that, but that is true. 
They are covered up. They are definitely subservient. And I'm not going to go into all of that women's suffrage. And it is bad in many parts of the world. In Iran, if a woman converted to Christianity believed on the Son of God as death, burial, and resurrection, she would probably be beat, raped, imprisoned, and maybe killed. There is a group of women that got saved. They believed on Yeshua, Jesus, and his resurrection, Messiah and his resurrection. They got born again, and a revival has broken out. To the risk of their very lives, they are propagating the good news, the gospel of grace. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. I love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, I'm a whosoever, are you a whosoever, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Well, Iran is the area in the world where the church is growing the fastest right now. Praise God for those bold sisters and brothers who risk their very lives to propagate the gospel. The motive in some hearts here, what Paul's talking about, was jealousy and rivalry. They preached Christ out of envy and contentiousness. Others had sincere and pure motives. They preached Christ from goodwill and an honest effort to help the apostle. Um, you know, I experienced this even as a young man. My pastor, Pastor Jim Travis, I got saved at five years old. I heard that wonderful message on John 3.16 and pondered that all week. And that Friday in my bedroom, I believed on Jesus and I let the Lord know that. And his death, burial, and resurrection. Well, by the time I was 12, I had been studying and reading. And I'll never forget the Sunday morning, Pastor Travis said, you're preaching tonight. I had never preached. And I'm like, because we had Sunday evening service, um, I'm like, okay. And I went home and I began to pray. I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I've never preached in my life. I, no one's taught me how to preach. Show me what you want me to do. And I went to the Word and Holy Spirit used it. That evening afterward, Pastor Travis told me, I thought that you would maybe speak for a couple minutes and it would be a good introduction for you and I could help mentor you from there. Holy Spirit took over, illuminated the Word, gave me a message. I preached for, I don't know, something like 45 minutes. I can't recall the amount of time. But Pastor Travis did not preach that night. And then he continued to mentor me. What an amazing man of God he was. And I have been blessed to have that mentorship, that godly influence in my life. And so I began to preach. And in some cases, go with Pastor Travis to places like Teen Challenge and Mission Teens and to the jail and different places, nursing homes. He would take me and I would pray for people and minister. And, and he was pouring into my life and, and, and recognizing and praying for me, the call of God on my life. It doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me spiritually better. Well, there was a young woman in the church who was also very active. And I'll never forget, she began to start a smear campaign because she was jealous and I remember Pastor Travis dealing with it and telling me, you let it go. Don't you carry offense. You pray for her. And he went to this passage, this scripture, was where he pointed this out to me, that in fact there are those who, while they preach the gospel and they do uh, things, listen, the works of the flesh mean nothing. It's Holy Spirit in us. We can't do anything apart from Holy Spirit. But she was jealous and began to spread lies. And he taught me, even church discipline from that. And why? Because I, I like this young woman as a friend. I couldn't understand what the issue was because she was jealous, because I was given pulpit time, because I went on ministry calls. And it was because there was a, the pastor listened 
and knew there was a call on my life and wanted to mentor me and disciple me and, and help me as the Lord was drawing me into the call, the anointing, the destiny, the ministry he had on my life. And I will forever be grateful to Pastor Travis for that. And she got over it, but it was the first time I saw this. And Paul saying, the jealous preachers thought that by doing this, they might make Paul's imprisonment more bitter. Their message was good, but their temper was bad. It is sad to think that Christian service can be carried on in the energy of the flesh, motivated by greed, strife, pride, and envy. This teaches the necessity for watching our motives when we serve the Lord. We must not do it for self-display, for the advancement of a religious sect, or for the defeat of other Christians. We see that even on YouTube. Those who hate others, who are anointed and called to preach the gospel, and they may even preach a similar gospel, but they'll look for the hatred. They're watching. They're looking for comments. They're looking for anything that they can pick apart out of jealousy. And I pray that they seek the Lord on this and that they understand their message may be right, but what's the motive behind it? Well, praise God, we're thankful anytime the gospel gets out there. Here's a good example of the necessity for our love to be exercised in knowledge and discernment. Others were preaching the gospel out of pure and sincere love, knowing that Paul was determined to defend the gospel. There was nothing selfish, sectarian, or cruel in their service. They knew very well that Paul had been committed to prison because of his bold stand for the gospel. So they determined to carry on the work while he was thus confined. Paul refuses to be downcast by the wrong motives of some. Christ is being preached by both groups, and that is for Paul a great cause for rejoicing. It is remarkable that under such difficult circumstances, Paul does not feel sorry for himself or seek the sympathy of others. Rather, he is filled with the joy of the Lord and encourages his readers to rejoice also. The outlook is encouraging. The apostle knows that the whole course of events will lead to his deliverance. And deliverance here does not mean the salvation of Paul's soul. Paul was already saved. He had believed on Messiah, Jesus, and his resurrection, but rather his liberation from prison. This, the means which God will use in effecting his release will be the prayer, listen to this, will be the prayer of the Philippians and the ministry or help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Marvel here at the importance which Paul puts on the prayers of a feeble band of believers. He sees them as sufficiently powerful to thwart the purposes and the mighty power of Rome. It is true. Christians can influence the destiny of nations and change the course of history through prayer. This is biblical. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ means the power of the Holy Spirit would supply to him. In general, it refers to the boundless resources which the Spirit supplies to enable believers to stand fast, regardless of what the circumstances may be. So, God's ways are higher and not the ways of this world. And I'm going to say it again. I said it earlier this week. We need to be people of prayer. We need to be people not for our salvation, but because we're saved and God ordained that we would live and breathe and have our being in these final moments. And we are in 
the final moments of the end of days. Wow! Prophecies are jumping off the pages of the Bible. Thank you, Lord. The Lord just showed me. Wow! The word to tell us die. It's the very same word that Jesus cried out on the cross to tell us die. It is finished. Praise God. The debt is paid for. Glory to God. The job is completely done. Brothers and sisters, whoa, we are witnessing these end time events. And it is imperative. I implore us, pastors, preachers, just like Paul did. What are our motives? Shame on us if we stand by while the innocent are being slaughtered. And I'm talking about the unborn here. Shame on us if we stand by while wicked leaders and men in prison, in sex industry, and other horrible service our sons and our daughters, shame on us for doing that. We pray, we withstand, we stand, we raise our voices, and God's ways are higher. Well, I pray this message has blessed you. I don't know about you, but I'm excited that God ordained that I would live and breathe and have my being in while very sobering, this most exciting time in church history. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his countenance be lifted on you and his shalom, his peace, perfect, whole, complete, nothing lacking, nothing missing. Be yours in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus Messiah, I pray and I bless you.